I'm Brenton from, um, from Datarock. Um, we basically build a lot of computer vision type technology um, for mining companies. Uh, and uh, today I'm gonna to talk to you um, about how we apply that technology uh, to solve some problems and also kind of uh, go into a little bit of the theory behind computer vision to kind of illuminate the, the technology. So, cool. So yeah, so specifically what we'll do today um, is we'll start with computer vision 101. Um, that's gonna be my attempt to, to explain um, deep learning and computer vision in a fairly um, straightforward way um, so that everyone can understand. Um, and then talk a little bit about some of the benefits and then we're going to dive into some into kind of three case studies. The first being a little bit about how we can clean up really variable historic kind of core photos to make them all kind of neat and tidy and available to be analyzed with data analytics. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some main segmentation work from Victorian Goldfields. Uh, and then we'll talk a bit more about how we can use uh, image classification in a supervised and unsupervised way uh, to learn things about the geology from core, core imagery. So that's the outline. Um, but essentially, visually, what we're doing today is we're combining the humble core photograph you know, or potentially some other kinds of core imagery with this field of computer vision that allows us to see the imagery with computers um, and basically generate some value from those imagery um, uh, that way. Must acknowledge my colleagues at Datarock. Um, I'm really presenting their work, not my own. Um, and we have quite a few um, machine learning engineers, geologists, and software engineers that work um, at Datarock on this um, on these workflows you'll see today. So I just wanted to acknowledge their their great contribution. Okay, so first things first, why would we want? Why on earth would we want to try to to extract geological information from core photos using machine learning? Uh, what are the what are the issues we've got with with the way cores currently logged or data is currently observed from drill core? Um, it's basically that more than one person can interpret the core differently. Um, so we have an issue with, with inconsistency. Um, but the really big problem with the, that we have when people log drill core in a production setting is that we lack audit trail. Um, so when someone decides that they wanna um, you know, call this rock this or that, um, or measure something one way or another, um, it's really in their head as to why they did what they did. Um, and then it flows onto a database and it's sort of considered to be done at that point. Um, so, so we lack the audit, auditability, we lack some consistency. So the benefits of um, potentially uh, augmenting or automating some of those um, workflows with computer vision and photography are that um, we can essentially try to collect similar kinds of visual observation data, but we can do it using a much more quantified um, method, which is leveraging computer vision. Um, some of the benefits specifically, um, apart from you know, it being uh, consistent and auditable, is that we can look at very fine scales uh, across very large amounts of data. So the scale, both the resolution scale and the scale of the data we can process is very high. Um, we can generate results really quickly, um, which can be really beneficial in a production setting in a mine. Um, one thing that happens in geology at the moment is that you're logging to a model and you get what's called model locked, uh, which means that whatever historically has been the model for the logging, you're kind of stuck with it because a lot of the core is degraded and, or it's sampled and it's gone. So you can't really go and drag that core out easily. Um, you, you, you get stuck with a model, whether you like it or not. And the nice thing about these kinds of workflows is that it's relatively straightforward to update a model, change a model and reapply it over the imagery. Um, so you have this fluid, fluidity of models. Um, but the bits probably the most interesting is that we can create new types of data, data sets that, that people can't create because it's way too fine a scale or it's uneconomic to log. Um, and we'll talk about some examples of that today. Uh, but of course, um, there are limitations. Um, if we're using just a, a humble core photograph or something that's just a visible light image rather than something a bit more um, sophisticated, uh, we have the limits of a static image. So for instance, we can't see inside joints because they're just not exposed in the image. Um, we can't pick the rock up, we can't scratch it, we can't test it in various ways to, to understand what, what the rock's made of. Um, and we won't be able to see more than can be seen in the image by a person. So um, we're not um, this magic thing that can see more than, than the eye can see. Um, but what we can do is see what can be seen really consistently at great scale and resolution. So that's the high level of why we wanna try and do this um, to try to improve things in industry. 
Okay, so I'm gonna go into a little bit of theory about um, machine learning, deep learning and computer vision, um, just so um, we can all be on the same page as to what the actual technology is. Um, and there's a couple of, there are some concepts here that are quite difficult. So I'm gonna do my best to try to um, explain them in a clear way. But if you have any questions, obviously ask those um, and we can try to clarify them. So first of all, what is, what is computer vision? Well, it's a subfield of artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence is really um, any kind of workflow that's trying to um, uh, mimic the behavior of human intelligence. Um, and so artificial intelligence can be, um, can use machine learning or aspects of AI don't, don't actually require, aren't actually required to use machine learning. For example, if we think about a self-driving car, a self-driving car um, is trying to achieve artificial intelligent behavior with the way it can drive. It's not quite there yet, I think, from all reports. Um, and some of that, the, the algorithms running inside that self-driving car will be based in machine learning. And some of them will just be kind of um, uh, human programmed rules. But together, they're trying to, to achieve that behavior. So, so under AI, we have machine learning. Machine learning is really a suite of algorithms that are able to learn from data. Um, and then sitting under machine learning, we've got deep learning. Deep learning is really a particular suite of algorithms that are deep neural networks. Um, and you see computer vision kind of um, intersects several of those different fields. Um, and that's because computer vision is really just trying to um, help a computer see something. It doesn't really care about the exact way you do it. Um, we'll be focusing on the bit of intersection between computer vision and deep learning in the talk today, um, because they're the algorithms that, that, that we use specifically to understand geology um, as well. So um, teaching a computer to see um, seems easy to, to many, but it's actually very, very difficult. Um, and it's difficult because we actually still don't really fully understand how our biological visual systems work. So how, we, how our visual cortex and how our biology works to allow us to see the world is well studied, but relatively poorly understood. Um, uh, so it makes, us makes it difficult for us to replicate some of that behavior with a computer. So why, um, why are you hearing so much about deep learning and computer vision and those sorts of things at the moment, um, probably compared to the, to the recent history? Well, it's really about the kind of confluence or intersection of a few different things all at the same time. So the first one is compute. So deep learning models in particular are very compute hungry. They require lots of GPUs generally to do their training and inference. Um, and it just so happens that there are all these big cloud providers now making GPUs really cheap, really accessible. Um, you can also send your data to and from those cloud hosted resources really quickly now, which means that we're able to facilitate a lot of that um, algorithmic kind of uh, effort. Um, it's no good having a bunch of compute if you don't have any smart algorithms. The algorithmic development that we've seen recently um, which uh, many of you will be, will be really familiar with because it's in the news all the time. Things like generative AI, such as um, GPT-4 or ChatGPT. Um, we've also got things like Segment Anything that's been released recently by Meta. The algorithms themselves are getting very, very uh, sophisticated. Um, and um, we're seeing some really amazing kind of um, uh, sort of products being released at the moment using those things. Uh, one one uh, diagram here to draw your attention to is the number of publications in AI overall um, from 1980 to 2020. And you can see that they're sort of more or less going vertical um, uh, around sort of 2020s plot only goes to sort of just before COVID. Um, and it, it's, it's clear that um, the algorithms are getting uh, really amazing. And then the other thing we've got now is a lot of sensors and data becoming available. So if we, if we think about something like Diamond Drill Core, there's a lot more ways to actually um, sense that rock now than there has been in the past, which means that we've got lots of different variables available to us. Um, we're streaming lots of vol large volumes of data. And if there's one thing that computer vision models and deep learning models like is lots of various types of data, um, large volumes of it as well. So we've got the compute, we've got the algorithms and we've got the sensors and the data um, all coming together and growing really quickly at the same time, which is making it really impactful time for for these technologies. Another question we get a lot is how good is a computer vision model at seeing stuff compared to a person? Um, and here's a, a really interesting example. Um, there's a database or a data set called ImageNet, 
It's a really commonly used um, database of imagery that's used in the computer vision fraternity. Uh, it's got about 14 million images that have been um, annotated um, with a class and there's about a thousand classes. So this data set has everything from bicycles to apples to backpacks, you know, um, lots of different things. And on the graph on the right, you can see here on the Y axis, we have what's called a top five error. And on the, on the X axis, we have the year. Top five error is just when, um, when the model predicted what it thought an image was, was the right answer in the top five um, uh, confidence um, predictions. And you can see here that each of these um, columns is a different architecture or a different model. Um, and you can see humans in red um, at a top five error rate of five. Um, so essentially these models surpassed human performance for this particular classification task in around 2015. So that gives you an example about how good these models can be when they're trained on a very large amount of, of high quality data, they can actually um, um, improve on human performance. That's not to say that these models are better than humans in every um, use case, but in this case, um, it, it was you know, shown quite early on that the models have surpassed people. Okay, another question that's worth kind of probing a little bit is how does a deep learning network or a neural deep neural network actually see something? Um, now this is a complicated um, analogy, but I'll do my best to, to get through it. So essentially here, we've got a diagram that has a, a simplistic um, neural network architecture. It's got an input layer, um, which essentially is the place where the images could be fed in the front of the network. It has a bunch of layers in it. Um, and inside those layers, we have these nodes or neurons in the open white circles. And then we have an output layer. And so what we're trying to demonstrate here is that um, uh, the reason why we might want to use a deep network uh, is because it has lots of layers. And lots of layers generally corresponds to how complex um, concepts that model can learn about what an image is or what any task is. So a deep network is generally a complicated network that can understand complicated things. Um, and uh, the way to kind of demonstrate that is that we have this kind of image of a face um, and this model is gonna to try to understand whether this particular face um, uh, is a person or whether it you know, is something else. Um, so let's imagine that we feed that, that, that human face in the front of the network. What we can see at the top layer or the most superficial layer is that the model is trying to interpret edges. Edges are the most kind of simplistic um, representation of what makes images look like something. Um, we're just talking about gradients at that point. Um, if we go deeper in the layer, now we're gonna see a layer that's trying to understand a more complicated concept about what makes a face a face. In this case, you can see some kind of creepy looking eyes and noses, um, ears even. And then if we keep going down the network, we start to see that these neurons are interpreting something quite sophisticated about what makes a face a face. You can see this kind of slightly terrifying human faces looking back at you. And so if you imagine this, this um, input image of, of, of this um, woman is being fed through the, the network, um, it's going to be passing through those nodes. These nodes will be identifying aspects of what makes that image uh, you know, look like one class or another. And, and, and as you go through the layers, It'll be making that decision based on different concepts um, of different levels of complexity. And then at the output layer, we basically want that image to, to fall out in the correct class. And the correct class here could be, you know, um, is, is this person wearing earrings? Um, does this person have two eyes or one eye? Um, it could really be any question you want. The key thing here is to understand that the network is interpreting the image in different ways. Each layer is looking at different concepts that, that, that make up that image. Um, and if we were using only a network that could look at one layer, which would some, be something like these edges, how good do you think it would be at actually getting the right answer? Um, if you fed in a picture of my face and a picture of Helen's face, in terms of the edges, it may be very difficult to discriminate us. But if you're looking at the, the, the deeper layers, you'll start to have more evidence that they can be subtly pulled apart and identified. So, so that's why a deep network's good. Um, that's the, the, the way this, they're actually seeing something is that the in, input images are passing through a series of rules. Those rules are kind of evaluating that image in different ways um, and are ideally making a correct decision. So that's my attempt to explain, <laughs> explain that relatively difficult concept. 
Okay, so how do we train a deep learning model to do something? Um, so these models are trained. Um, they want to basically fed data that's, that's labeled with the correct answer, essentially. And so how we make a correct answer, generally, when we're talking about geological applications, is that we want to annotate something on an image. So that might be an example where we might want to draw around lots of different veins and we'll have people or geologists actually draw around those examples. We want to create you know, hundreds to thousands of those examples. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to feed those examples through our untrained network. And that network will give the wrong answer. So we'll feed in an example of a vein and it'll say, this looks like a fracture um, because it doesn't actually know and it hasn't actually been trained for that task. Then what we can do is we can allow that network to adjust itself. It's going to adjust itself based on those decisions that we talked about a moment ago. Um, and basically it will keep adjusting itself until the wrong answer becomes a right answer. Um, and if we feed enough labeled data through the network, then it can learn what makes the right answer most of the time and basically establish a set of rules within the network that gives us a, a, the outcome that we're looking for. And this takes lots and lots of iterations. So if I feed one image through the model, it might learn something, but it might only be a very small thing. But if I learn a small thing a million times, then I've learned a lot. Um, and that's how these networks can, be very, can become very intelligent. So essentially very high level, we're feeding data through with the, with the answer that's known. The network is being asked to try to replicate that answer by changing itself internally until we start re reproducing that answer on the labeled data. Um, and we do that over and over and over again until we start getting the right answer all the time. And that's a very simplistic kind of explanation about how we train uh, a deep learning network or other types of machine learning algorithms as well. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that it's very analogous to how our brains learn. So we learn by experience, we learn by repetition. Uh, our neurons tend to strengthen the um, behaviors that, that give us the right outcome and diminish those, those neuron connections that don't um, provide a, a useful outcome. And so we're strengthening the bits that help and we're weakening the bits that don't help uh, in our brains. This is what we're doing inside um, a neural network in a, in a simple way. Okay, so here's, let's use an example. We will get to rocks, I promise, but we're gonna start off with something a little bit more simplistic. <clears throat> so here is a very um, well studied database. It's, it's called MNIST. And essentially it's a, a really large 60,000 know, image data set, which contains hand-drawn letters. Um, this is a variant of very early models that were used um, and, and um, generated because we needed to automatically identify postcode digits written on letters. Um, and so what we're going to do here is we're actually going to try to visually watch a network learn how to classify numbers into the right um, group. So for instance, a one should be classified and, and be called a one. So if we go over to the actual image itself, we can see that we've got, um, in this case, a, a, five, a four layer network, including the output layer. And what we're going to be doing is feeding in a, a, a image of a certain number. Um, and we're doing that over and over again. And basically what we're seeing is uh, the model getting it wrong and then updating itself visually. So if we step along with the video, we've got a zero being fed through the network and it's being called a zero, three, four, and a five. A four is being fed through the network and it's being called more things than a four. Um, and the key thing here is what we want is a four being just called a four, a zero just being called a zero. But what we're finding is that that's not the case because this network is still learning. Um, the way the network actually updates itself um, after it gets an incorrect answer, we call that back propagation. And you can kind of see these colors flowing back into the model. That's a visual representation of the um, nodes changing themselves in some way to ideally not, not get the wrong answer the next time it tries. And so this is just what we would say two iterations of what might be many, many millions of iterations where we're feeding every number through this network and we're getting the wrong answer and saying, change yourself and get the right answer next time. And doing that over and over again until we do. So that's an example of a network getting it wrong, but learning something from um, the experience. Now, if we wanna look at a network that's actually getting the correct answer for the, for the number nine, we're feeding the number nine in, it's activating various types of decisions. It's giving you a representation at the top about what those nodes are actually kind of looking at. Um, you can see they're looking at different aspects of the shape and the way that nine is constructed. And then you get the answer nine coming up clearly in the activation in the output layer, and it's just been called a nine. Um, so that is the example of the correct behavior we're going for with this model. 
these nodes and weightings have updated themselves um, in order to get the correct answer for this um, classification problem. Okay, so enough about um, hand-drawn digits. What about actual rocks? So <laughs> how do we train a network to see rocks? Well, we have to, first of all, make a decision about what kind of model we might wanna make. Um, there's a few different choices about the different ways we can approach um, uh, this kind of modeling. Um, but the key thing is we have to label many, many examples of the thing we're actually trying to model. So if we go through a couple of examples of the types of models that we make, uh, at the top, we have what's called instance segmentation. It's basically us trying to predict a, a colorful polygon around every fragment of rock in a core tray. Um, and you can see here, we've got kind of cylinders of rock. They've got little blue polygons around them. We've got core blocks, they've got green polygons, broken or out of place materials, got brown polygons uh, and empty space in the tray has a pink polygon around it. So this model has been trained by people sitting there and drawing around lots and lots of fragments of rock. It's as simple as that. And then the, the network is being fed those examples, it's learning from it, and then it's actually trying to um, predict that same behavior across a very large amount of data. Um, if we go down to the image um, below, um, we can see we've kind of divided the world up into little squares. Each row has been chopped up into five by five centimeter squares. And what we're doing here is we're trying to classify the geology inside each square. We're saying, is it lithology A or B? Is it alteration A or B? Do I see you know, broken rock or a texture in this, in this square? And basically what we need to do here is label a bunch of squares that have each different type of geology in them. And we might need to do that many thousands of times um, those training points are then fed through the model. And again, it's gonna learn just like we've discussed previously to actually reproduce that behavior when it's presented with a new image it's never seen before. And then on the bottom, we've got an example of uh, a vein segmentation. Here, we're trying to classify all the pixels that belong to this certain vein class. Um, and to do that, we need to draw around all those different veins and feed that labeled image through the network and let it update itself to produce the correct answer. So, so yeah, so the, I guess the key, key thing about what all we've talked about is that these models learn from experience. You have to give them lots of examples of the correct answer and that's how they learn. They learn by changing themselves internally to reproduce the behavior that's in the training set. And then they can be used to push data out across um, imagery they've never seen before. So that's the, the, the quick and dirty explanation of what deep learning and machine learning is. Okay, so let's let's watch a network learn how to see a vein. Now, um, this uh, network, I'm gonna let it get right back to zero and we're gonna talk through um, the kind of process. So the first thing this network's doing is it's trying to identify key regions where it thinks a vein might exist. Um, you can see these boxes basically have confidence scores. They're jumping around until they're pretty confident and then the confidence goes right up. And then inside that box, the model's next step is to say, well, what pixels inside this box actually belong to the vein? And, and I'm gonna to start to try to find those as well. And you can see that each iteration is us sending um, a training point through the model and the model is um, improving itself. So what we're looking at is the model attempting to do this task after learning a little bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more and a little bit more many, many hundreds of times. So, so this is about as close to watching the learning happen as you can kind of can kind of get. <clears throat> okay, cool. So that's the end of the kind of theory section. Um, and hopefully that illuminates a little bit about what we're talking about when we talk about what computer vision is. So next up, we're going to apply this computer vision models to some you know, typical core photos that you might get in industry, which can be a bit um, variable. Um, and we're gonna to try to turn a raw image into an analytics ready image that we can actually do some data science on uh, at the end. Cool, so here's um, so, some examples of some core photos. Um, there's lots of different box types. There's lots of different kinds of configurations. Different countries do things differently. Um, some core photos are taken outside, some are taken inside. And what we need to do is be able to get at the information we really wanna get at and have it in a format that's makes it easy for us to, to actually get the value out of it. So there's two key things you've got to do with core photos. One, you've got to crop all the stuff out that you don't care about. So the box and the background and, the, and whatnot. Um, and the next part is you've got to actually register the pieces of rock in depth space. And so I'm going to show you a, a workflow um, that you can use to, to try and get to that um, uh, kind of level of curation. 
So first things first, we can use some of our deep learning models that have been trained to automatically know what a core box is. They can be used to crop um, a box out of an image or crop a row out of an image. Uh, here you can see some red um, marks on the core. These are predictions from a deep learning model that have been trained on many thousands of, of core trays from all over the world to know what a row core looks like. So these automatically go, yep, that's the row core. I'm going to crop you out. Um, once we've got those nice cropped rows out, they look a bit like this. Then we can start going into the actual material that's inside the row. And we can say, find me all the chunks of rock that are inside there. And find me the bits of rock that are nice and coherent and find me the bits of rock that are all smashed up. Um, and once we do that, then we can end up with something like this. And this is kind of step one. We've, we've isolated the actual geology that we want to analyze and we've got rid of all the stuff that we don't really care about. So step two is we need to actually register that core in depth space. Um, depth registering of drill core is actually a, a big black hole of complexity that's not done particularly well in industry at the moment. Um, but we can do some things to try to do this as best we can. So the first thing we can do is we can try to read meter marks that are drawn on the core by hand. We can try to automatically interpret those to be able to um, uh, use them to as reference points for depth. So here you can see um, some optical character recognition, which is just a machine learning model that's trained to, to read handwriting. And it's trying to read um, the meter marks here, it's trying to work out which ones look like they're correct to use and which ones aren't correct to use. And you can see that um, we initially thought that you know, meter 218 was here, but then we read that meter 218 should actually be here. So we can actually adjust that depth to, to match with the annotations on the actual drill core. So what we ended up doing there, as I mentioned, is we might adjust those meter marks to their correct position as per the OCR. Um, we can measure all the fragments of rock inside these rows because we've detected them all, um, which means that we can basically work out, do I have a meter of rock between every meter mark um, and do a bunch of QAQC. And then when I'm done with that, I get this kind of final depth registered strip image. So this is kind of like the final registered image that we can then do all of our later analysis with. Um, and you can see that if you had a very large amount of data, it's very difficult to get people to manually do all of that. So by training a deep learning model, uh, it takes a little bit of effort to set up, but once it's set up, it just runs and, and can do that work um, very quickly. I'm not going to talk about geotechnical engineering at all today, but I just wanted to throw out you know, a, a, a use case, uh, which is really significant, probably more than half the work we do at DataRock. Is, um, is basically analyzing the way the rock breaks and presents in the core train. Um, and here's an example of one of our um, fracture analysis models. It's looking for the way the rock breaks and, and whether we can measure that feature or whether it's too difficult to measure. But that's all the geotech I'll talk about, I promise. Okay, so let's talk about um, some veins. So, so veins are a really popular um, thing to analyze with computer vision. Um, because A, they're really time consuming to log by hand. Um, generally, they're getting lumped in counts or densities by, by loggers. But it, if you can actually go in and measure each vein very, very in a very detailed way, you can generate really useful stats like abundance, count, uh, orientation, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I'll show some examples of, of what you can do with veins now. Okay, so... <clears throat> As I mentioned before, there's kind of a few different ways you can phrase problems to these deep learning models. Um, we're going to look at a, a couple of different styles of model, but I'll go through all four um, just to explain kind of what they are. So we, we can do what we call image classification. That's what we talked about before with our little squares. Here, we're just saying, does this image contain a vein or not, or the class vein? Um, and this is equivalent to what we probably do when we log veins sometimes. We just say, where are the veins? Um, did I find one here or did I not find one here? Um, that's really the easiest kind of type of, of deep learning based image analysis you can do um, and easiest to train. If we go on to something a little more complicated, we have what's called semantic segmentation. This is basically, we're going inside the image now and we're trying to pull out all the pixels that belong to the class called vein. Um, but our model doesn't know what one vein looks like. It just knows that I'm looking for pixels that, that belong to a vein type. Um, and this is really useful if we want to you know, understand something about the density of veins, for instance. Um, if we move up in complexity a little further, we have what's called object detection. And this is where we're trying to predict a box around one example of a vein. So the reason why this is more complicated is because our model needs to know what one vein looks like 
and what one vein looks like when it's crossing across another vein. Um, and in this case, we, we call these instances. So teaching a model what an instance of something is, is, um, is an, another level of compl complexity has to be trained into, into the model. Um, and then the, the most complicated model and the model type that's probably had the, the most development recently by some of the big kind of AI companies is called instance segmentation. And that's where we're trying to find all the pixels that, that map the exact border of, of an instance of something. In this case, we're trying to say, find me the vein, map its exact boundary, but also understand when I've got two veins on top of each other that you have to understand that that vein kind of gets lost and then pokes back out the other side. Um, so these things are very simple for us to see and, and judge, but very difficult to train a, a machine learning model to do. So in our case studies today, we're going to talk a little bit about the classification and semantic um, only. Okay, so um, the first case study is from a deposit called Sunday Creek or a development project called Sunday Creek. It's in the Victorian gold fields. Uh, it's an orogenic gold deposit. It's got intrusive mafic dikes and a bunch of uh, associated stibnite. Um, and for this particular um, deposit, what we wanted to do was build a five class vein model that could go and work out the abundance of each vein type along with kind of some shape and size parameters across about 13 kilometers of drill core. This required us to manually label by hand 5,865 individual veins. So sitting there and clicking around those veins um, and the outputs of the model are the count of veins, the volume of them and some shape parameters uh, as well. So how thick are they? How thin are they bumpy and irregular? Or are they nice and straight, curved, et cetera? So our, um, our classes, quartz, stibnite, pyrite, quartz plus stibnite and quartz plus pyrite. So here's an example of the, what the predictions look like. So on the top image, we've got the original cropped out, curated depth registered image. And on the bottom, we've got what's called the, the model prediction um, or the model mask. And you can see that basically um, we've got a segmentation result for each of the five classes, which are represented by a little colorful kind of blob. Um, and once we've got that colorful blob, we can start working out, well, what the, what's the total area of that, of that material? Um, how many individual islands of material were found? What were the shapes and sizes of, the, of, those, um, of those blobs? Um, and here you can see, you know, we're picking up different things like um, pyrite. Um, we're picking up various types of quartz, sometimes complex shapes and sizes of quartz. Um, and essentially we're doing this over 13 kilometers. And when you're predicting a model like this, it can be predicted over that amount of data just in a couple of hours. So getting a very fine, fine level of detail of a very large amount of data in a relatively quick way, even though you had to sit there and draw 5,000 veins at the start. It's still a net gain in terms of time savings and detail. So what does this data look like? So we've got um, on the left, uh, we've got the veins logged by the geos on site. So um, didn't have a heap of time on their hands to log everything, but what they had logged is shown there um, uh, in the little colorful disks. And then on the right is the model prediction over all 13 kilometers of core. We're looking at the total quartz vein area in this one, even though we've, we've got lots of other data sets we'll show shortly. Um, the total quartz vein area kind of, I thought illustrated what they were drilling at pretty clearly. You can see this kind of very bright region in the middle here. Uh, you can see that's where their drilling is really um, centered around. And you can see you know, the, the vent density of quartz veins in particular are very high in that, um, in that area. So we're looking at um, a quantified percentage um, of, of the amount of quartz, um, which is very difficult to log by hand. If we go into some of the other vein types, we've got um, the pyrite and stibnite veins. These are thresholded to only be looking at intervals that have more than half percent by area. Um, and you can see that we're getting nice detailed information about not only where we found greater than half percent of pyrite, but then also what was the actual quantified amount we found above 0.5%. Um, and so there's the pyrite and the stibnite. We've also got the, um, the quartz pyrite and the quartz stibnite in the same way. Um, and you can imagine um, you know, how much they're learning about the deposit and the nature and, and the positioning of those veins and, and vein types. Um, we're not even really looking at some of the more complicated statistics we can make. We're just looking at how much we found, not the shape, size, count, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, cool. So to summarize that really quickly, um, uh, you can see here, we're now looking at the total veining area over that, over that deposit. We're able to create these quantitative vein, vein abundance areas, um, all the core using those five key types. 
Um, and one really interesting data that you get out of this at the end is what area of rock, um, sorry, what area of vein was found over the total area of rock that was drilled. So in this case, we found that over these 13 kilometers, 2.6% of the rock itself was quartz by area. 0.3%, um, 0.03, um, sorry, was stibnite, 0.02 was pyrite, 0.13 was quartz stibnite, and 0.06 was quartz pyrite. So it's a really interesting different way that you can visualize the abundance of, of vein types and actually look at a quantitative number like area. Okay, so to move on to a slightly different um, Victorian goldfields example, um, uh, here we're looking at um, a, a small satellite deposit that's adjacent to Fosterville Gold Mine, uh, one, of the, you know, one of the best gold mines in, in Australia that's um, located just near Bendigo in Victoria. Uh, here we're looking at a much simpler vein model, but that, that's predicted over a very, very large amount of data. So here we've just got a very simple two class vein model. Basically the model is saying, is this pixel a vein or is this not? Um, we labeled around 15,000 individual um, examples. Uh, and this was pre predicted on 1.4 million meters of drill core. So this is the you know, very, very large amount of, of drilling. And the outputs that we, we actually um, calculated here are things like the count, the volume and the shape. Um, and the neat thing here is that the quartz stains here host a lot of gold. Um, they're time consuming to log, but the very, these are actually very straightforward to find um, with a computer vision model. Here's a, a cool example, um, cross section looking through Robbins Hill. Uh, I think we're looking to the north uh, here and you can actually see these west dipping structures in the quartz vein volume. Um, so this is like a new data set that they didn't have until we used this technique. Um, can, these are actually um, correlating with their west dipping structures in the deposit. So we're getting these accumulations of, of, of um, quartz vein volumes along the, um, along the fault planes, which is um, really cool to see. Um, this is around 300,000 meters of, of drilling. Okay, so now we can look at something more like uh, image classification. Um, so instead of segmenting something from within the, the drill core itself, in this case, we're just going to say, what is this image? What kind of rock does it contain? Um, and where, where did I find it? So as I mentioned before, first thing we need to do is to isolate some image that we would like to classify. The way we often do it is we divide those rows into little squares. They could be longer rectangles, depending on the size of the thing that you want to find. Um, and we can look at these images in an unsupervised way, which I'll show next, where basically we're just saying group images together that look the same and, and make populations without a model, just to show me the, the, the similarity space. And then we'll talk quickly about um, how we can um, create some quartz vein um, style models and also a lithology model as well. Okay, so first things first, if we would like to um, look at our data in an unsupervised way, so look at our data and group it in the absence of a model, we need to create some variables or numbers that describe the imagery and describe that imagery in a way that's, that's really good and familiar for us. So we can actually use a neural network to do that. Um, I won't go into all the complexities for time here, but basically we can run imagery through the network and we can use the numbers that are within the network as descriptors for the image itself. And so um, what we do for each square is we generate something like 2000 numbers that describe visually what that image looks like. And then we use those numbers to basically to group imagery into populations that look similar. Now here's the scary part about um, presentations. I'll hopefully show this video and it'll work. Um, so this is a three dimensional embedding of um, what we call image similarity. Um, Imagine something like a principal component analysis. Um, we're looking at three dimensions and images that plot together in this space are visually similar to one another. Um, and so we can kind of see the cloud. We can modify that cloud and turn it more into a sheet, something like a self-organizing map might make. We can go into that sheet and we can start to browse and analyze populations of imagery that ideally look similar. And the really nice thing about this unsupervised approach is it's, it's irrespective of a model, which means that we aren't being too model driven. We're letting the imagery tell us something maybe new, um, but then we can use this as a way to create a big training set really quickly for a supervised model um, that I'll show next. So, so yeah, I, I might stop the video there, but basically we can explore that imagery that's in a different way, rather than looking at just in a drill hole, we can also look at it in um, similarity space. Just stop that video. Cool. All right, so if we do have a model we actually want to produce, 
what we can do is we can train it to care about something that we are interested in. In this case, what we've done is train a model to pick up five different subtly different types of quartz veins from the Fosterville gold mine. Um, the exact nature of these quartz veins has been a while, um, but um, these are uh, large extensional quartz veins. Uh, we've got some kind of laminated carbonaceous quartz veins in the middle. Uh, there are transtensional veins and shear veins, which are a little bit more discrete and isolated. But suffice to say, the important thing here is there, there's an uh, understanding there are five different classes. We've trained a model to, be, um, uh, to care about each of those five classes. Um, and then what we're gonna do is predict that over a very large amount of data. So here's an example of the output um, here. We've gone down each drill hole. We're um, breaking the world up into these little five centimeter chunks. We're saying, what did you find in each five centimeter image? On the top in the blue, we've got all the places where the model found a square that contained what was considered to be the court style A or, or a mass of the blocky quartz. Uh, and then everywhere in red, we've got quartz style B, which was a, a more carbonaceous um, uh, quartz stain type. And you can see here that we've, um, we've got lots of detailed um, information about where those veins exist. So this would be very time consuming to do with a person, but relatively efficient to do with a model like this, because these are relatively obvious in the core itself. If we wanna go and look at that same kind of data over a big cross section, um, same ones we were looking at before, um, you can see here, we've got these kind of west dipping um, um, structures. We've got big yellow high volume quartz veins um, in the yellow there. We've got red, um, shear veins in the red, and then we've got these kind of gray valence that are sort of everywhere. Um, so you can see that we've, we've, we've up, actually upscaled this a little bit, but you can see there's a very large amount of data that's been created um, with this method. And the last example here to finish up on is an example of how we can um, create models that can see lithology. Um, and one of the things I wanted to show in this example was that um, these models are very good at understanding um, variation in, in input data. So here at Fosterville, they had a lot of years of photography collected from lots of different photography systems, everything from iPhones all the way through to more high-end uh, imaging systems. And what we're looking at here are the 10 classes of lithology that we were looking for. And we're looking at a random 100, predict or 100, 100 or 200 predictions or something like that from each class. I'll go through the classes quickly. We've got... Um, uh, one of the kind of background um, silt stones, we've got um, shotcrete. Uh, we know it's not a lot of lithology, but it was something they wanted to pick up. Uh, we've got some one of the weathered um, uh, girthite rich zones. We've got black shale. Uh, these three kind of gray units are all variations of the background sediments and or dikes. Um, we've got another weathering unit. We've got a, a, a heavily quartz veined um, unit. And then we've got this kind of laminated carbonaceous quartz vein unit as well. So. All you can see here is that we're, we're predicting these. The, the sprites kind of look similar, which means the model's probably doing a reasonably good job. But you can see in the bottom center here that there's this really stark difference between some of the, the images at the top and some of the images at the bottom. And that's because the actual photography system changed really significantly. So the top imagery are from the newer system and the bottom imagery are from the older system. So this model has learned to still do a reasonably good job even though it's being fed two very different things that are being called the same unit. And that's one of the real powers of deep learning is that you can train variation into the model as long as um, uh, you don't have so much variation in that input that it overlaps with the variation of other groups. So you can see here that some of these other gray units start to look a lot like some of these um, image variations. So that's where the model can, um, can struggle. Let's have a look at the prediction from this lithology. Um, across um, a cross section through um, Fosterville. You can see here, we've got this kind of weathered orange units at the top. Uh, if you can see the yellow units, these are the various types of dikes that are cross cutting through Fosterville. The various shades of gray are siltstones and sandstones, which are just interbedded um, with each other. Uh, we've got uh, laminated um, quartz veins in red and black shales in the maroon. So they're very detailed and very high frequency, could be slightly difficult to see, but suffice to say, we logged a lot of core across the deposit in a relatively short space of time by training one of these models um, on these examples of, the, of how they look in the imagery. And all these models are just based on imagery. There's no chemistry being included here. Um, one last thing was that uh, the more obvious the thing is in the image, the, the high performance you're gonna get from a model. So here we've got some logging from one of the sericite altered um, uh, dike types that you get at um, Fosterville. On the left, we've got what's been logged. These are, this is a bunch of drill holes looking north. Uh, the strings are turned off. 
And then we've got the predictions in yellow. And you can see that we're broadly getting the same answer because this uh, rock type is bright green, super obvious in the core, which is a great place to automate because it's so easy to log um, why are people wasting their time uh, on that. They should be focusing on things that are a little more difficult. Uh, I already showed that one, so I'll skip through. And just this is my last slide. So um, last thing I wanted to mention was that um, you can get a lot of detail out of these models if you want. Um, so here is an example where we're basically looking at the highest resolution that we can kind of produce. On the far left, we've got the dominant color as we've extracted it from the core photo. The second column from the left is the log by the Fossilville geos. Um, one thing to note is that the light blue unit is an interbedded unit that contains both sandstone and shale um, kind of rhythmically going backwards and forwards. And they're lumping based on whatever they think um, is, is, is interbedded. Uh, and then these the next columns are all the actual predictions from the model. So you can see they're really, they kind of look a bit noisy, but what they're doing is they're actually looking at every individual interbed, every interbed of, of sandstone and shale. Um, and so this log is looking at detail in a lot finer scale than, than the geos would have time to do. Um, but what we can do is we can upscale those logs to, um, to be a little bit more um, uh, kind of coarse, a bit more fit for purpose. Um, and so we've got a three metre composite here, which is saying in these intervals, the dominant thing I found was either sandstone or shale or, um, or quartz or, or whatever the case may be. The last few columns here are also very interesting because one of the side benefits of this type of model is that you get a confidence as well. So not only does, do you have the model says, I, I found black shale here, it says, I was like 56% confident it was black shale. So I can plot those confidence scores down the hole and actually turn my kind of categorical data into a numerical data set that can be analyzed in, in, in different ways. So I think I'm probably just about out of time there. Um, and that's my last slide. So, um, so yeah, thanks very much. And yeah, happy to answer any questions.